Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Looks like I got a little echo. Give me just a moment to take care of that. All right, I think I might echo taken care of. If you can hear me, I'd really appreciate a yes, you can hear me in the questions page to get this morning started. Awesome. That looks great. Thank you so much uh, for the responses. Um, <clears throat> my name is Tom Godet. I'm a product manager here with Kepware Technologies. Uh, just to here to introduce and uh, get things kicked off for Mike Latham, who is going to be presenting and giving some demos about the new features of Kep Server EX version 6.4. So I want to let you know that uh, for those of you who registered or, or not, and for those that were unable to attend this morning live, they'll be able to re they will receive a recording of this uh, webinar, which will be posted on YouTube, and they'll get a link to that as well as a PDF for the slides. And if you ever have any questions about uh, the technology or, or seeking out some training, please feel free to reach out to our training department uh, at Kepware.com. Uh, they're always there to help you out. Um, we do have a rather short agenda today for version 6.4, but there, there's some robust features. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just turn it right over to Mike Latham, who's going to kick this off. Thanks, Tom. Uh, again, this is Mike Latham, I'm a senior applications engineer working in the product management department. Uh, as Tom alluded to, we've got four, four things in our agenda today. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about, uh, probably the most exciting, at least from my perspective, is a brand new driver, uh, the MQTT client driver. So we'll spend a little time on that. Uh, we did some modest but notable performance improvements uh, to the Siemens driver. We'll, we'll talk about those. Uh, for those of you that use a lot of Siemens, uh, I'm sure you'll recognize the importance of the improvements that we made. Uh, and then some CODASYS tag browsing work. Uh, we'll take a look at that. Uh, and then for folks interested in ThingWorks, um, we have recently enabled Store and Forward uh, to help with network connections. Before I go into any of that, I just want to throw out, feel free to ask questions at any time using the questions tool. Um, Tom will be here answering questions live. Uh, we may stop a couple of times and, and answer some questions. Um, in the webinar, depending on how many questions we get. So feel free to throw out any questions about anything related to CapServer. Let's talk about the MQTT client driver first. So first, let's talk about what MQTT is. A, a lot of our kind of typical Kepware customer, uh, at least historically, is more of a controls engineer, maybe less of an IT person. MQTT is pretty common. In the IT world, a little less common in the controls world. So this is a lightweight message protocol, and that's one of its biggest strengths. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it has very little overhead to send messages. And why do we use this in kind of the industrial world? So what we're seeing in the last year or so is an evolution of sensor networks that are going through gateways and then publishing to MQTT brokers. We'll talk about that architecture here a little bit in a minute. But what this might look like in a facility is, let's say I have an older machine that probably has PLCs already running it, you know, running the motors, uh, running uh, whatever needs to run on this machine, but maybe there's some additional data I'd really like to get off that. Let's say temperature and vibration. I don't necessarily need to hook up a new PLC and wire up all of those sensors. A lot of these solutions have wireless sensors. Uh, and they use a variety of technologies to get that wireless information back to some sort of gateway. But the key about all of those technologies is they're pretty robust. And oftentimes, they'll use some sort of mesh network uh, or similar that allows wireless to work in an otherwise fairly difficult wireless environment in a typical factory. 
and then we'll collect that data directly and pipe it up to an MQTT broker. So we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. So, you know, what are these, you know, I talked about this, the sensor networks through a gateway. And then another one, there's actually some of the newer PLCs are supporting MQTT natively. Uh, we've worked with one of the Vago devices here. Uh, I know there's a few other devices that are starting to, or at least have some products in beta with native MQTT support on a PLC. So let's take a look at how MQTT works. So one of the most important pieces of MQTT is there's a broker that sits in the middle between a publisher. The publisher subscribes to a topic, or excuse me, publishes to a topic on the broker. And then there's a subscriber that subscribes to that topic. So let's talk about that a little bit in sort of the most basic format. So let's say, for example, I have some sensors in my basic home automation system. I might have a variety of sensors in my house, and I might break down my house into a variety of subtopics. So for example, I could have Mike's house, subtopic, Mike's living room, subtopic, Mike's lights. And as part of that, I would have data that I would then publish onto the topic, Mike's house slash Mike's living room slash Mike's lights. That data might look something to the effect of, you know, light one, light two, light three. And for each light, I might have intensity and, you know, a Boolean of is it on or off. One thing I should point out uh, is that in the newest version of the MQTT spec, there's been some nomenclature changes. So the broker is now called the server and the subscriber is now called the client. So for all of you intimate with OPC, that probably sounds very familiar. Let's talk a little bit more about the power of this model. I can do lots of things with a broker. I can have multiple publishers to a broker I can have multiple publishes to multiple topics. I can have a subscriber that is subscribing to multiple topics. One thing you should keep in mind is the new client driver from Kepware does not come with its own broker. Many of the gateways that are on the market have their own brokers. Uh, as well as many of the cloud uses of MQTT, including Azure and AWS, have their own broker. If you do encounter a system that you need to set up where you need to use your own broker, there are a couple of widely used publicly available brokers, notably Mosquito and HiveMQ. In fact, the majority of the commercial brokers simply utilize those publicly available ones and build on top of them. So why are we using MQTT in what's historically kind of an OPC world, an industrial automation? So one use case, I can publish the data directly to the cloud. So let's assume in this use case that I have no uh, local SCADA system, and you know maybe I'm a smaller manufacturer and I'm just starting to set up an IoT system or maybe I have a cloud-based IoT solution for visualization and I don't have any other real sensors going on at this point. This is a total, totally new thing for me and so I'm gonna set up my wireless sensors and pipe that data directly up to the cloud, and then I could pull it back down into my cloud-based IoT solution. Uh, because of the low network bandwidth that we talked about earlier, you know, the, the message, it only has a seven byte header followed directly by the data. So there's not a lot of overhead with this. It's pretty inexpensive from a network standpoint. It's not bogging down anyone's network. So that's one use case. 
So the other kind of more, I would say, use case that we're seeing probably get the most traction is I am a good size manufacturer. I, I already have Kep Server. I'm thinking about putting Kep Server in in order to feed my SCADA and MES system. But I want to get this new style sensor data into my SCADA. And so I can do that using Kep Server EX and bring that new set MQTT sensor data directly into Kep Server and into my traditional SCADA. And then I can even combine it with things. So for example, you know, if a vibration exceeds a certain value, I could flip a Boolean to turn off a machine that is being controlled by another PLC. So let's take a look at what this looks like in practice. So one example here, uh, we've got the wizard platform by BNB Smartworks represented here. So you can see exactly what I was describing before. This is a mesh network of wireless sensors that feeds back into a hardware gateway. And then that hardware gateway is publishing up to a broker that is included with that system. And then a variety of things can subscribe to that broker. Uh, any any cloud-based thing, often these uh, gateways, the vendors have their own cloud platform, as well as something like ThingWorks, Azure, AWS. But I can also bring it into Kep Server now. So if I've got my traditional SCADA hooked up to any number of PLCs, you know, we've got Alan Bradley and Siemens represented here, I can now pull that MQTT data in to my traditional SCADA via Kep Server. And let's not forget, we can also publish data using the IoT gateway. We're going to come back to the differences on that here in a minute. But first, let's take a look at an example. So what I have here is I've set up a device and a channel. I'll just open the channel briefly here. So the channel is where I'm going to set up my real connection. Uh, so the real thing that matters here is this is the web address of the broker and the port. Right now I've got security disabled, but you could make this as secure as needed um, through standard certificate exchange. So I'm going to cancel out of this. So this particular device is actually sitting at BNB Smartworks uh, and publishing to a public broker. And the way BNB creates their topics is this alphanumeric here is actually the MAC address of the gateway device. So you can see I've already created a number of tags for this device. Let's talk a little bit about how those tags get created. So first let me launch our quick client so we can take a look at these guys. I'm just going to blow this up a little bit so we can get a good view of our payload tag. So in 6.4, we do not have automatic tag generation. So you need to know how to construct these tags. The keys to the kingdom on being able to do this are this pound payload tag. So in the world of MQTT, you can put almost anything into the JSON payload of an MQTT message except there's two reserved characters, pound and plus. So you can see pound payload is going to return a string of the entire JSON payload with all of the what's called key value pairs. So let's look at one of those. So I have this data value of S and the value of that variable s is presently six. So we can look down here to see all of this stuff to the left of the plus sign was our topic. And now we're pulling out the individual p value of s right now by creating these tags. So all of these tags are created manually by looking at this payload and saying, great, these are the various 
items here. Now let me put the, pull those out into various tags, and then you can address them and use them just like you do in any regular SCADA. Before we go on, Tom, do we have any questions coming in on that? Or if there's any, uh, any questions, I'll just pause here for a minute. I know for a lot of OPC folks, uh, this MQT might be a little bit new. No, Mike, it doesn't look like we have any uh, particular questions uh, as they come up. I'll, I'll definitely uh, interrupt you if necessary. But Sounds good. good. Let's keep moving then. All right. Minimize these guys, and we'll go back to our presentation, I think. Try again. There we go. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about the differences between the IoT Gateway and the MQTT client driver just briefly. For any of you that are interested in trying out the IoT, or excuse me, the MQTT client driver, I encourage you to do so. The first thing I'll recommend is don't even open the IoT Gateway. We've had a number of early users get a little bit confused between the IoT Gateway and the MQTT. Uh, client driver, it is true that the IoT gateway is capable of subscribing to an MQTT broker or server. However, it isn't very good at it, to be completely honest. Uh, it was something we added in order to get kind of our toe in the water. And I really see the future of the IoT gateway is primarily a publisher. So if you want to subscribe to, i.e. collect data from an MQTT device, the MQTT client driver is really the way to go. And the other big difference between the two is the MQTT client driver, you can create native tags. So as soon as I have that value, I can create a tag and then use that tag just like I do anywhere else in Kep Server. The IoT gateway is I'm associating values with tags that already exist. So the classic use case is, let's say I've got a Siemens PLC that I've got tags from that PLC, and I would like to monitor those tags via an MQTT solution. I could then publish those tags using the IoT gateway. If you have any questions about that, by all means, uh, contact our, our sales and we can get you on the phone with one of our sales AEs. Or if you have any questions right now, we'd be happy to talk about that. Uh, I just wanted to throw that out there. The handful of people that have used this so far, there's definitely been a little bit of confusion using the IoT gateway. Hey, Mike, uh, we have a question from the audience about the way that the JSON payloads are parsed and how goes into the subsequent tags. Could you describe that a little bit in more detail? Sure. So let me just bring up, I think I've got the quick client going here so we can see. Yeah, so let's look at this payload tag. So typically the way that you're going to see a JSON payload published by a publisher up to a broker is something very similar to this. So this is literally the JSON payload. And so you can tell that by the beginning of this curly brace and the end of this curly brace, that is a standard JSON format. And everything in that, so if we, I don't have a specific JSON payload uh, up right now on my computer, but if we were to open this, the JSON payload that produced this, what we would see is virtually exactly what you're seeing in that payload tag. You would see those, uh, the data identifiers, if you will, in this case, uh, the S and the T and the Q and the C, et cetera, uh, followed by a colon with a value, followed by a comma. That can take many, many forms. There's virtually no limitations in MQTT on what that JSON can look like. We have tested a variety of things. It can get into arrays and nested arrays. 
Um, we, we support everything that we've been able to get our hands on and test against. Uh, I'm, I'm open to the fact that there might be something out there that we, uh, we need to do some work to support. But uh, right now, pretty much anything in JSON we can support. There are some, it's possible with MQTT to send something other than a JSON payload. You could, for example, send a binary payload. Uh, however, it looks like the market is predominantly using JSON as the payload. Cap server currently only supports that JSON payload. We could not, for example, support a binary payload. If there's any follow-ups on that, please feel free to uh, ask away. So let's talk about Siemens. So what we changed in Siemens is the length of the protocol data unit. So the PDU is kind of the chunk of data that the Siemens S7 protocol passes back and forth. So up until now, the Siemens Ethernet driver supported a maximum of 255 bytes. If you look at the little table I've got there on the second bullet, you can see for an S7 300 and a 1200, that's just fine. For the more powerful 400s and 1500s, what could conceivably happen with the 255 limit is if I was trying to read or write significant volumes of data, typically at high rates, so think tens of thousands of tags with sub, sub one hertz update rates, I could be sending so much traffic over the wire that I could eventually start to lose updates. And so what we've enabled in this release is the ability to select your maximum PDU size. That little drop down there is directly from the, uh, it's a screenshot directly from Cap Server. And I can now select the maximum. If you don't know, that's okay. Uh, just pick the maximum and the driver will auto negotiate using the protocol down to the most appropriate. So for example, if I pick 960, I was using an S7 400 that only supported up to 480. That will enable me to allow the protocol with Cap Server to negotiate it down to 480. If you are in a scenario with limited bandwidth, you can reduce that number. So if you select 240, for example, even though you're running an S7 1500 that's capable of 960, you might select that 240 because you have limited bandwidth. That's okay, it will maintain that 240 and not auto-negotiate it up. All right. Next, let's talk about codices. So tag browsing is pretty interesting. Let's talk a little bit about this. So for those of you that aren't aware, uh, the Codasys driver is relatively new. Uh, I think 6.2, we released Codasys. Maybe we started in 6.1 and then did some more work in 6.2. We eventually lose track around here. Uh, what we've enabled as, as part of this new tag browsing ability is the ability to filter and search for tags prior to the tags being brought into Cap Server. Uh, I'm sure many of you have dealt with devices that you've got many tens or even hundreds of thousands of tags on a device. And presently in Cap Server, the only way to deal with that is ATG that entire lot of tags and then go into Cap Server and delete the ones you don't want. What we've enabled for Codasys in this release is the ability to go in, select which tags you'd like to select, and then bring them in. Notably, this has also been enabled, enabled through the API. Uh, so for those of you doing programmatic uses of Cap Server with the API, uh, this starts to become really powerful. Uh, there's a note there on tag generation. We won't spend too much time on this now. Uh, if you've got questions about kind of the differences in tag generation between versions 2.3 and version 3x of Codasys, feel free to uh, 
shoot us an email and we can follow up with you working on that. There's definitely some nuances to, to that. So let's take a look at what this really means. All right, so let's see, I'm gonna close my quick client. All right, so I have previously created this channel for Codasys and connected to this device. Let's take a look at it. So this is a, let's see, a couple defaults we don't worry too much about. All right, so just look at this real quick. So I've got a, a version three code assist device. Uh, that was determined back in my channel level. We didn't look at that. Um, and in version three, you can see there's a lot of stuff grayed out. All I really need to specify is the IP and the port. And now we'll take a look at tag import. So I'm gonna click on this select tag import settings. So you see it's spinning right now. So what it's doing is it's actually going down to the device and reading from this device. Uh, it's only looking at the top level. We don't want, we made that decision at, in order to speed things up. So this particular project on this device has about 87,000 tags on it. And if we were to read every single tag during that communication, this would take many, many tens of minutes. So instead, it's reading the top level. So every time I expand a tree, you can see it spins for a few seconds, it's reading that top level. So let's take a look at, let's see, we'll take a look at my structure a 1D folder here. What do we have in that folder? So we've got a bunch of autos, I've got a bunch of my underscores, some my bools down below it. So let's take a look at our filter. Let's say that I know I want anything that starts with my underscore. So I put the wildcard at the end there. Now I'm gonna click apply. I do have to drill back down in. And so if we look now at my struct array 1D, if you'll remember, this folder started with a bunch of autos. You'll note that those are no longer there. And then on the back end of those were a bunch of my bools. Those are all gone. Uh, so why don't I, so I've got automatically generate subgroups. So that's gonna select all these guys. I'm gonna pull those over. All right, so let's just say for example that maybe I don't want a couple of these. I can select a few of these out, get rid of them. Now I've got a pretty rational list. So you can see the power of this, um, particularly with very large projects. And you know, probably one of the more interesting things about this is as we go into the future, we've set up a lot of underlying, new underlying services to enable this. So we can slowly start to enable it for additional drivers. And let's just go back to our demonstration here, or excuse me, our presentation here. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is some ThingWorks enhancements. Uh, so not notably, we've got store and forward, uh, and then there's one additional enhancement that we'll talk about at the end. So store and forward. So I think most of you are probably familiar with this concept. It's the idea of I have some sort of network outage between Kep server and whatever I'm trying to get the data to. So in this case, this is ThingWorks. Typically where we're concerned about this is not inside a factory per se, but it's through some large, uh, large network. So maybe that's a remote site type of installation. It could also be, I have my factory, but I have a cloud instance of ThingWorks. So let's talk about a few use cases. I think uh, fall was starting to come upon us when we originally put this presentation together here in Maine, and we were thinking of warm weather as it got cold in Maine. So our, our first example here is monitoring hotels in the Caribbean. Uh, but I'm monitoring them from Spain through data centers in various parts of the world. You can imagine that I want this real-time data, but I may very well have network outages periodically for a variety of reasons. 
And the idea with this is that I've got all of that data once the network comes back online. I've got an example here in oil and gas industry is often monitoring using telemetry. You know, it could be a satellite, could be uh, radios. Oftentimes there's, there's issues there. And when that connection comes back online, we'll get that data through. Uh, another great example here of autonomous farming equipment. Maybe it just uses Wi-Fi. It's collecting data on a combine or something. And then as it gets returns close enough to the Wi-Fi signal near the farm, you can upload that data. So let's just look at this example. So if I have Kef server, I'm connected to ThingWorks. When my connection is good, you can see I've got data routed through the, it's to represent a disk drive in the middle there, but nothing is there. It's pretty much just popping into the drive and being read back directly back out to ThingWorks. Then I lose my connection to ThingWorks, going to fill up that local drive. I reestablish the connection. It's going to start writing data out until it catches up. Configuration of this is very straightforward for those of you familiar with configuring Cap Server to push data to ThingWorks. It's in the exact same location in the properties, and we've got a small section that's been added for store and forward. So you simple, simply enable it, point to the, the drive where you want to put it. A couple of caveats here. It needs to be a local drive. Uh, since we were trying to pr protect against network outages, it seems silly to us to be able to point to a networked drive that may, may be in a different location that would be impacted by that. And then you specify the size of the data store. There's some great examples in the help file too that talk about what that really means relative to what is your update frequency, what are the number of tags you're pushing, and what's the duration of outage that you're trying to protect against. The last thing we're going to talk about uh, relative to ThingWorks is remote saving. So in the last release, we did about half of this, and we're just kind of rounding that out. And what we refer to it as remote project push and pull. And so what you can now do is if I develop a project in Cap Server, I can now push that up into ThingWorks, or, or I guess more accurately, I can pull it from Kep Server using ThingWorks. Uh, what we enabled in 6.3 was the ability to push Kep Server projects down. The idea behind this is I have, for example, 10 factories that are configured similarly and only one SCADA expert in the company. I can have that person deploy uh, Kep Server projects to call it the other nine if he works at one of them, uh, enabling a, a local technician to make small changes for things like IP addresses and whatnot, but to have the bulk of the configuration finished for them. And that's all I have. Did we have any other questions that we wanted to follow up on? Uh, not at this time. Uh... We have a quick question from uh, Bullet. Uh, his question is, which sort of database ThingWorks is using, uh, Oracle or SQL? Uh, I think you might be asking uh, for our store and forward feature, uh, so I'm going to answer that question first. Our store and forward feature is using um, our own binary format, which allows us to store that uh, value quality timestamp data from the tags in a very efficient manner locally on the machine. Um, and uh, thank you for the yes on that. So that was what you're asking. We're using our, our own custom format files for that, uh, and they only live as long as necessary for the, the storage of that information. Once it's pushed up to the platform, uh, the ThingWorks platform, those uh, the, the data is then removed. And the notable piece of that, which is I suspect where you were going, was no, you don't need to configure another database like SQL or Oracle and manage that database on the back end. We are 
dealing with that storage for you. So we'll stay here uh, for a few more minutes if there's any other questions. Uh, but just pointing out, uh, we've got a variety of places you can learn more about Kep Server. Uh, we have a variety of vid videos. We have, you know, if you want to request training, there's a number of webinars that are out there uh, that were are always being published. So there's a webinar calendar, uh, and then as well as we're we're frequently in the news. I think I think mostly for the the good. And just a list of emails there. Again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to contact us. We've got sales, training, tech support. Anywhere you'd like to get a hold of us, we're pretty easy to get a hold of. So again, I'll, we'll uh, keep the webinar live here for just a few more minutes if we have any more questions. Uh, is asked if we would be able to show the slide about the major differences between the IoT Gateway and MQTT client driver. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get back to that. up to that guy. Let me answer some questions. Let's see. I think the only other question I'm going to I'm going to answer here is to Bashar, which I will do to you selectively, Bashar, because I don't think it necessarily applies to the entire audience. Uh, but I will I'll get back to you right now. So relative to the client driver versus the IoT gateway. Let, let's talk about this uh, one more time. So the MQTT client driver, it can only subscribe to the broker. And let me actually back up one more slide here. Well, I guess a couple more slides. There we go. Um, so remember the, the architecture of MQTT. So the publisher is the thing sending data out. So in the case of the MQTT client driver, we're typically going to have sensor gateways like the BNB Advantech uh, solution that I alluded to earlier, publishing data to a topic. And our MQTT client driver would then subscribe to that topic to collect the data. And that data would be put placed into tags. In the case of the IoT gateway, it is capable of publishing, and that's what it's best at. But it's also capable of subscribing, which is a little confusing. Let's just talk about the publishing use case first, because that's what it was primarily designed for. So. If I've got a PLC inside of Kep Server and I want to monitor tags on that PLC and publish those up to some sort of MQTT enabled IoT solution, for example, there might be a couple of significant cost drivers that my CFO wants to know about. I could pretty easily spin up a basic website or something and publish this data to that. So the IoT gateway is very good at publishing. The MQTT client driver is very good at subscribing. So I'm just going to go back to our other slide here. And then the individual tags are, are the other big difference. So the MQTT client driver, that data is placed in native tags, just like if those, if those data points were on a PLC. The IoT gateway, alternatively, is an advanced function uh, of the server. And it needs to have tags that are already in the server tagged into, excuse the, the language there, tagged uh, <laughs> for tags. I need to select the tags in the IoT gateway in order to determine what I want to publish up to a broker. And the one other point that's worth talking about is the publishing, or sorry, the subscription method in the IoT gateway. The reason it's a little bit clumsy is it requires a very specific format in the broker so your data can only be formatted 
in the way that we expect to see it. Alternatively, the MQTT client driver subscription, pretty much any shape of JSON payload, we can pretty gracefully ingest. So I, I hope I answered your question there, what you're trying to figure out. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we do have one other question that I think that we should touch on uh, as we close out here, and that is specifically on pricing uh, between or the differences between the IoT gateway um, MQTT agent and the MQTT client driver. Uh, that pricing is available currently on our website. We chose, much like our other drivers in our product, to go with a one price for the driver uh, functionality as opposed to a tiered portion like you see in the uh, the IoT gateway. So the number of tags is not limited by the MQTT client driver. Um, again, you can reach out on our website for the pricing on that or to your local representative in the country that you're, uh, that you're in and they can help you out with that. Um, and also our sales team, of course, can, can assist you at any time. Uh, with that, I think that's all we have for today. Thank you so much, Mike, for uh, presenting and showing us some great features of Kept Server EX version 6.4. And to all of you that came in and listened today, uh, I hope to hear from you again soon. I know that I'll be reaching out to a couple of you with uh, some follow-ups. And enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of the end of the year and your holidays. Happy New Year. Thanks, everyone.